Wireless data. It's what connects us to just about everything. And full power license spectrum is how it gets from point A to point B. Americans will use five times more 5G data by 2027. To make sure all Americans benefit from secure, reliable 5G networks, we need more full power license spectrum. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum. We range from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at The Bulwark, and I am joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and The Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker, who writes the Substack newsletter Notes from the Middle Ground, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. We are delighted to welcome as our special guest this week, my Bulwark colleague, Will Salatin. Will has written either a very long article or, depending on how you want to look at it, a short book called The Corruption of Lindsey Graham. And it is really, I cannot recommend it highly enough because, as you'll hear in the conversation we're about to have, it is not a profile of Lindsey Graham and it is not a tell-all about Lindsey Graham's private life or anything like that. It is a political science evaluation of how corruption happens and how authoritarianism can take hold of people. So let's start, Will, with why you chose Graham as your model of how this descent into corruption and authoritarianism happened. Well, so Lindsey Graham was in the middle, obviously, of a lot of what happened during the Trump years. He was also one of the people who was most clear about the danger that Trump posed to the United States, to democracy, to the rule of law. That's in 2015, 2016. He became, over time, obviously one of Trump's most aggressive apologists and enablers. So that's part of it. But I was much more interested in him as a model of what happened to the whole Republican Party. And the reason that I was able to write this about Graham was that unlike a lot of his colleagues, such as Paul Ryan, Marco Rubio, other people who enabled Trump, Lindsey Graham talked constantly. So he left this enormous record of one interview, briefing, statement, social media post after another. So it was possible to track over time, week by week, month by month, how he changed, how he rationalized, how his standards and his orientations and his arguments evolved so that he could rationalize serving authoritarianism. Right. And Will, for people who may not recall, can you just remind us of the kinds of things that Lindsey Graham was saying about Trump when he first began running for president in 2015 and 20, you know, early 2016? Sure. Lindsey Graham called out pretty much everything Donald Trump said. Most famously, of course, he called Trump a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. That was a line that he later withdrew, apologized for. When Trump said that Muslims should be banned from the United States, Lindsey Graham denounced that, said it was un-American. That's not how we do things in this country. When Trump said we should target civilians <laughs> with drones and stuff like that, when Trump said we should have prosecute people or punish people before their trials. All of that Graham denounced as betrayals of American values and procedure. So one of the things that's so great about this piece that you've written is that you show how it's really a matter of inches that you first begin to rationalize and to excuse and to make yourself more comfortable and it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates until finally you have a transformed person who suddenly has seen no moral compass. Yeah, it's important to understand that this didn't happen overnight. There's a caricature of Lindsey Graham and to some extent some other Republicans that they flipped on Trump. It wasn't that way. And you don't get to the point that Lindsey Graham got to in one move. So for example, when Trump fired the FBI director, he fires Jim Comey, who was investigating him in the Russia investigation. That's May of 2017. It's a step-by-step -step process. First, Graham, he's trying to defend this. He says, well, the president was just trying to protect Mike Flynn. First, he says that what Flynn did was wrong, talking to the Russian ambassador about lifting sanctions after Russia has just helped Trump get elected. Then over time, he modifies that. It's not wrong. It's okay because it was after the election. Over time, Lindsey Graham gets around to the idea where he is today that the whole idea of the 
government even tracking what Mike Flynn said to the ambassador, which is standard protocol when you're talking to a Russian official, was wrong, that it was a, an evil investigation and that Mike Flynn is innocent and that anyone who investigated Mike Flynn was wrong and destroying American values and procedure. All of that is just an extension of this trajectory that he went in, but it didn't happen all at once. It was step by step by step. Yeah, it's kind of heartbreaking in a way because uh, Lindsey Graham was, before the advent of Trump, he was the kind of Republican who prided himself on friendships across the aisle, on working across the aisle, on cooperating on things like the immigration reform proposal and other matters on foreign policy. And he transformed himself into someone who felt that any depredation any crime, any horror on the part of Republicans was okay because the worst possible thing would be the ruinous rise of the Democratic Party to power. Right. That's actually a really important lesson from this story, and it applies in lots of other countries. The demonization of the other party. Now, of course, each party does things that are wrong and bad, and it should be called out for them. But the demonization of the other party to the point that you've convinced yourself that they are so evil and so dangerous that you must vote for whoever is the nominee of your party, whoever in your party can get elected, in this case, Donald Trump. That is how you get to rationalizing authoritarianism to a great extent. It is the lowering of the threshold so that every sin becomes minor by comparison. Okay, I'm going to see if our panel wants in on this. Damon, any reactions? I'll just begin by saying, uh, well, I love the book. Uh, I actually plugged it last week, not knowing you were going to be on this week as my highlight of the week. I very much enjoyed it. I learned a lot from the details, even though a lot of it was almost like a stroll down memory lane, because as a close news watcher, I remember most of these quotes as they happened. But to have them all together put in chronological order and woven together with your very skillfully and powerfully constructed narrative was extremely illuminating and troubling. It's a very important contribution to our understanding of all of this. I guess the one thing I would ask you about is a dimension that is not really emphasized as much in the book as I may have expected. And one way into that issue is something that you yourself bring up. I believe it's your second to last chapter, which is the one that covers January 6th. On January 8th, Lindsey Graham is going through Reagan Airport, and he's accosted by a few dozen absolutely rapidly angry Trump supporters who scream at him, call him a traitor to his face. It's all captured on video, which was circulated at the time. And you do mention this and say that Trump ended up pointing to this as evidence that this is how we got Lindsey back on our side. And you sort of dismiss that, which is fine for that particular incident. I don't know enough details to know what was really going on in the guy's mind. But it did strike me at the time, and it still strikes me now, that this is a glimpse of really what is going on in the dynamic, that the voters are crucial to this move that you recount Lindsey Graham and so many other Republicans making in those years, is that you have a kind of triangle with Trump and then his voters. And then the third point on the triangle is the rest of the GOP elected officials. And Imagine what it's like. You're an elected official. You have to face the voters. They come to your office. They leave you voicemails. They send you emails. They show up in your Twitter feed. And now they accost you at the airport and scream at you in hatred for the stand that you've just taken, critical of their hero and tribune. Isn't it also the case that a big part of what's been going on here is that Trump has successfully activated a kind of rabid authoritarian lust on the part of a lot of Republican voters, and the Republican elected officials are running scared from this. They're terrified of it. And even if they were principled and quit, as some did during the Trump years, wouldn't they then be replaced by people even worse simply because the voters would continue to want what they want? 
First of all, Damon, thanks very much for your kind words about this book. And I, I want to agree with you. Your thesis is correct. The voters who are behind Trump are a huge part of the problem. If Donald Trump disappears tomorrow, he's already demonstrated that there is this constituency that another would-be authoritarian can come in and pick up. And that is an enduring problem, and you put your finger on it. The only distinction that I would draw is it didn't happen at the airport. It had already happened well in advance of that point. And an illustration of it is when Graham ran for president in 2015 and was pointing out that Trump was a dangerous demagogue, he said that he was going for a different constituency within the Republican Party from the Trump constituency. And he described this in an MSNBC interview as Trump was going for all the people who think Obama is a Muslim and came from Kenya, and I'm going for the other crowd. And by other crowd, of course, Graham meant that he thought there were enough other Republicans who disagreed with that to nominate him, Graham. And he was wrong. He, was, he, he lost badly, and Trump ran away with the nomination. And so by 2017, when Trump comes into office, Graham starts talking about Trump's voters, and he calls them we. We. So he's changed his orientation. They were a they, and now they're a we. So it's exactly what you describe. He has fallen in with these authoritarian voters. and. I would add, Damon, you're exactly right about the underlying problem here, which is this is a paradox of democracy. We believe that when the voters elect someone, we accept their judgment. That is what democracy means. What do you do then when so many voters want an authoritarian? And it's clear in this country that a lot of people chose Donald Trump for that reason, and they would choose another Trump follower, another Trump copier for that reason. Can I just jump in, though, with a quick observation here, which is that it is, though, also a conversation. So you wouldn't have voters in such a wrathful mood if you didn't have people like Lindsey Graham going on Fox News all the time and riling them up with stories about stolen elections, which he has done. And so he has incited the very thing that he's afraid of. Mona, you're exactly right about that. And a classic case of that, of course, is January 6th. We all remember Graham on the floor of the Senate on the night of January 6th saying, count me out, enough is enough. You know, he's yep. claiming to be horrified by all this. But when you go back, as I did, and you look through everything Graham said on TV, on Fox and other places for the two months leading up to January 6th after the election, he spouted all those lies. He talked about machines switching ballots to Biden, trucks and ballots in the middle of the night, all that stuff. And he said, he said to the Fox viewers, we win because of our ideas, we Republicans. They, the Democrats, win by cheating. That is absolutely a recipe for inciting an insurrection because you're telling people their votes will not matter. If the other side won, ipso facto, it is cheating. And therefore, you have to somehow take up some sort of action beyond voting to, to overturn that. Bill Galston, thoughts? I think this is a character study. And you've revealed Lindsey Graham to be a weak man. You know, he has gone from following John McCain to following Donald Trump. It was often said that when McCain was buried, that Lindsey Graham's conscience was buried in the same grave. And I think that's true. But this is not just a character study of one character. It illustrates the political consequences of weakness when the only thing that can avert disaster is strength. We've seen this story over and over again. So I'm not sure what the moral of the story is, because most politicians, when you get right down to it, are weak. They are ultimately subservient to the judgment of others in the same way that business people are weak because they're ultimately subservient to the judgment of their customers. Strength is a very rare commodity in politics. There are reasons why Profiles in Courage is such a short book. <laughs> uh, and so we celebrate the exceptions. We celebrate the Liz Cheney's of this world. Query, did Lindsey Graham ever have what it would have taken to be a Liz Cheney in these circumstances? Is this a character decline or rather the revelation of what Lindsey Graham always was? Really interesting question, Bill. So I am a fan of the revelation view of this, that what Trump did in general, not just for Graham, but for a lot of Republicans, was to reveal 
their inner weakness because they hadn't faced this before. Even Graham himself didn't think in 2015 that Trump would get the nomination. So he said it's better to lose without Trump than to win with him. But it wasn't until Trump got the nomination and then won the election that Graham was actually tested, right? And he failed the test. And of course, all the other Republicans failed it too. And I I do want to make sure that we don't come away from this story just pointing to Lindsey Graham and saying, that's a weak man. Because it's really easy to point to other people when, first of all, it's not true. Lindsey Graham, it's not true that he believed in nothing. Lindsey Graham has very strong views to this day about foreign policy, right? He had to fight Trump about keeping troops in Syria, about keeping troops in Afghanistan, about supporting NATO. And he did at various points do that. So he didn't believe in nothing. He just decided that it was more important to have Trump do what he wanted in the rest of the world than to protect the United States. And that's a sad irony of this story. But to your point about character, I think you're exactly right, Bill, that character is crucial here. We like to think in our country that our institutions protect us, but our institutions don't protect us if we don't have the character and the will to stand up for them. And there's a really simple example of that. There was a bill that came up in the Senate in 2018, and Lindsey Graham agreed to go along with sponsoring it at the behest of some Democrats to protect Robert Mueller, to say that if the president tried to fire the special counsel, a panel of judges could review that, right? He helps draft the bill, and then the Republican senators decide they don't want to bring it up because it will upset Trump. They explicitly say this. It'll be poking the bear. We don't want to upset him. So Mitch McConnell decides, I'm not even going to put it on the floor. And Lindsey Graham says, that's fine. Well, you've just had a failure of will to exercise a congressional check on the executive. So I think you're exactly right that character is crucial and that character in this case failed. Linda, As the poem put it, the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. Bill and Will were discussing weakness, but one of the things that Will also addresses in this short book is that authoritarians in general, and certainly Trump, one of the traits that he has is that his will to power, his will to dominate, was so strong, it eventually wore people down. It wore down others' will to resist. Well, I think that's right. I do think that there is a not insignificant portion of the voting public and even elected representatives who are not leaders but followers and who really are willing to be bent and who look for a strong man. I think that is a characteristic, a human characteristic. There are a portion of people who don't want to make decisions themselves, don't know what to believe about certain things, and look to someone else to give not just guidance, but absolute direction. And I think Lindsey Graham has always been that way. I found the whole thing rather depressing. And I guess I have a question for Will. And that is, is there any hope? for a different direction for conservatives in America. Because that's, to me, as I've said many, many times, I still believe myself to be conservative on a whole host of issues. And the question is, is there any hope in today's two-party system of a conservative party emerging that will satisfy both those of us who believe in conservative principles, but also very much don't like authoritarianism, don't like the kind of xenophobic quality that's overtaken the Republican Party. So my answer to you, Linda, is certainly there's a hope of that. And we don't really need to look farther than Ukraine and the way that Republicans have dealt with that to see that there is still in the Republican Party, a strong strain of politicians who believe, for example, in a muscular foreign policy and in standing up to aggression. And while Trump and Tucker Carlson and certain parts of the Republican Party have tried to abandon that, Mike Pence and Nikki Haley and others, they still carry that flag. We could point to some other issues. But to answer your larger question, Linda, it sort of depends on how you want to look at it in terms of hopefulness about the future. I believe fundamentally this story shows that what happened to the Republican Party was not that they all fell in love with the idea of authoritarianism. They wouldn't even call themselves that. They don't think of themselves that way. What happened is that they were all exposed as cowards and they went along with an authoritarian. So the upside is if Trump disappears from the scene and another Republican gets nominated for president who is of a more traditional bent, a Reaganite, then I think a lot of the party will fall back in line. They won't resist that any more than they resisted Trump. 
The downside is, what are the chances that Trump is the last one of his kind, right? Now that this has been shown to be effective in this party, now that the party has been shown to have a very weak immune system against authoritarianism, I think there's just going to be a whole slew of people running in that niche, in that lane of the strong businessman who's going to tear down the establishment. We've been doing things the same way too long. I'm going to get my way. I'm going to use power. I'm going to expand my power. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to hurt the people you hate. I just think there's going to be more and more of them. And as long as the cowardice is there, the problem is not that the Republican Party is fated to be authoritarian forever. It's that it's always going to be vulnerable to it. Well said. All right. With that, I highly recommend this piece and people can find it on um, Amazon.com. And of course, you can get it by going to thebulwark.com. And by the way, if you go to thebulwark.com and sign up, you will get for free three daily newsletters, podcasts, all kinds of things that we offer free of charge. Highly recommend that people do that for all of the quality products that are available every single day. You know how it is when you walk into a store to buy shampoo or soap or something and you're just overwhelmed with choices? Sometimes that can make things hard. It's easier when you have fewer choices sometimes. And it's great when a company comes along that is providing a high quality product that you can rely on and you don't have to worry about making choices from a million options. Harry's Razors is one of those companies. Harry's razors are refilled when you need them and delivered straight to your door. So you can choose Harry's once and then they will take care of the rest. Get a quality shave without the hassle with a $3 Harry's trial set. The starter set is a $13 value for just $3 at harrys.com slash beg to differ. For just $3, you will get a five blade German engineered razor, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover. Plus, you can schedule replacement blade delivery whenever you need them with refills as low as $2. Harry's also makes other great self-care products more than ever before. Shaving creams for before and after your shave, body washes, hydrating lotions, and more. These are blades made in their own factory in Germany that hold up better than ever. Guys who've tried it say their eighth shave is as sharp as their first. Save the hassle. Set up your delivery and get the best quality shave with Harry's. Get a $13 starter set for just $3 at harrys.com slash beg to differ. That's harrys.com slash beg to differ for a $3 starter set. China is making 370% more 5G spectrum available than America. Tell Congress to restore FCC auction authority and allocate more 5G spectrum to make sure America leads the industries and innovations of the future. Go to more5gspectrum.com to learn more. Now, I'd like to turn to um, two reports or one uh, letter and one report that dropped this week. Uh, Finally, John Durham, the independent counsel looking into the origins of the investigation into Trump, finally issued his report. And also Representative Comer of the House Oversight Committee, who had been promising all kinds of bombshell revelations about the Biden crime family, also came out with some findings. So Bill Galston, I'm going to go to you first. Your observations on either or both. Well, the seriousness of Mr. Comer's investigation can be judged by the fact that he is not able to locate the person that he has labeled the chief witness for the case that he wants to make. (laughs) And as for the Durham inquiry, I saw a political cartoon in one of the newspapers that has a file labeled results of the Durham inquiry it's open and there's nothing in it. And I am not saying that Durham did not unearth misconduct. In my judgment, he did. And a lot of people in the FBI and elsewhere, I think, did things that in retrospect, I hope they wish they had not done. Does it rise to the level of a deep state scandal? 
not in my judgment, and I suspect not in the judgment of most other observers, even though the Trump right is doing everything it can to gin this report up into something much more serious, conclusive, and damning that I think it is. We'll see whether it has legs. I rather doubt it in part because, you know, Mr. Durham, as far as I can tell, didn't come up with a bunch of actionable recommendations. And so I'm not sure what happens from here to keep the report in the public eye. So, Damon, just to refresh people's recollection, at the beginning when this thing was first set in motion, Trump and his acolytes were all saying that this was going to reveal the huge deep state conspiracy to get Donald Trump, that it was a corrupt effort to pin something on him and he was completely innocent. It was called a Russia collusion hoax and Durham was going to bring the goods. And what has he provided? I mean, Bill mentioned there was some misconduct by the FBI, which I would note had already been revealed by Mr. Horowitz, the um, inspector general of the Department of Justice, who already reported that. And the FBI has since changed its procedures. But my impression is even the Durham report acknowledges that the opening of this investigation was justified based on the information that was given to the government by an ambassador from Australia about some weird information that he got from George Papadopoulos, et cetera. And so his big thing that he's hanging his whole 300 plus page report on is that they should have opened a preliminary investigation, not a full investigation. Wow. Big whoop. Yeah, that seems like a decent part of it. I have to say that at this late date, I sort of would love all of this on both sides to just sort of go away. I am so tired of this. Donald Trump very clearly went out of his way while running for president to stick his finger in the eye of the quote-unquote liberal media by kind of deliberately drumming up the worry that Russia was somehow involved in his campaign. You know, the famous press conference where he says, oh, yeah, you know, uh, come take the emails, Russia. Listen in, Russia. And and that was kind of a joke for him, but he loved that he was owning the liberals. Well, A lot of the liberals took that very seriously. The FBI took it seriously. And you know what? Good. (laughs) He's running for president of the United States. And he's pretending that he'd be excited if he got help from Russia. And we now know, because of all the investigations that we have had, Mueller and others, that they were eager for it. They really were. That nothing that much ended up happening. But say, if Russia had been even more aggressive about it and tried to set up an act of collusion, do you imagine that Trump or Trump Jr. or any of the senior people in his campaign at the time would have rebuffed it out of any kind of patriotic or any other kind of moral standard of saying, no, we won't do this. What are you talking about? That would be treason. No, they would have been like, really? Uh, What can we do? How can you help us? So I have no patience for people who try to treat Trump as some kind of a victim and all this. And on the other side, the FBI was clearly overzealous and in kind of freak out mode through a lot of this period. Sort of like understandably, if I were working in the FBI and saw what was going on with meetings and public statements by the Trump campaign, I would have had some pretty raised eyebrows as well. Then I see all of the reaction from the Trump right, including its sort of ostensibly highbrow people like Compact Magazine has up a self-described leftist giving an indignant defense of Trump against the FBI because if they can do it to Trump, they'll do it to the next time a leftist is running for president. And I swear to God, I just want to say, oh, just go away, all of you. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) it's like a hall of mirrors now where like, you have to spend like 
weeks and weeks of your life rummaging through hundreds of pages of reports. And as you noted, so the big takeaway from the Durham report is that it should have been a preliminary investigation and not a real one. Oh boy. Yeah. That's really deep state, really dangerous. (laughs) Earth shattering. Everybody needs to remember that Hillary Clinton was running for office while under investigation for using a private email server for State Department business. It was not a good move on her part. But the subsequent Trump administration did things right along those lines about a thousand times worse. And Hillary Clinton was investigated, was sort of semi-exonerated with a slap on the hand by James Comey, who then reopened the investigation 10 days before the election. And Trump and his friends are now all indignant about the fact that there was a real investigation versus a preliminary investigation going on that the FBI bent over backwards to keep secret until after the election. Will Salatin, there have been a number of different reports and investigations into this. One of them was by the Senate Intelligence Committee. And both Republicans and Democrats signed on to a report by that committee where they said, for example, that, quote, Manafort's presence on the Trump campaign and proximity to Trump created opportunities for Russian intelligence services to exert influence over and acquire confidential information on the Trump campaign, unquote. And they went on to say that one of Manafort's associates was a Russian intelligence officer, and that this represented a grave counterintelligence threat. Yeah, so I fully agree with Damon on uh, his analysis of what Trump did. Trump absolutely attempted to collude with Russia in lots of ways, as Damon just outlined. But I want to take a different view of the Durham investigation. I'm going to be an optimist about this. I'm happy that Durham investigated this. I'm happy he came out with this report. And the reason that I'm happy is I love evidence. And I love the idea, and I hope that this country can always settle disputes with evidence, right? And sometimes the evidence shows something really bad. And sometimes you go in claiming that you're going to find some really bad evidence, and you investigate, and you get bupkis. And that's kind of what happened here. Durham comes out. He didn't find any wrongdoing among intelligence officials. He didn't charge anybody in the FBI. There's two people who were charged earlier in the investigation. Both times, juries threw out the charges. In his report, he couldn't even find a formal rule that the FBI had violated by opening the investigation. In fact, Mona, he found that all that stuff Republicans said about the dossier and the FBI hid the information about the dossier, there were some problems in the investigation. But they have in the report, in the Durham report, it shows that Pete Strzok, the allegedly anti-Trump FBI agent, he warns his colleagues to beware of the dossier because it's obviously designed to influence and whoever commissioned it, he said, was presumed to be connected to the campaign in some way. So I think that this investigation basically shows that its premise, the reason it was assigned, doesn't bear out and it's a vindication. And so I'm delighted with that. And I think that clears the path for us to be clear about what Trump did and about you know, the the relative innocence of the FBI and the people who investigated Trump. Linda, Durham did get one guilty plea, but it was a case that was brought by others and then handed off to him. And that was the guy who changed an email. So that was his one scalp that he got in this. So he did get that one person. But the response on the right is, of course, despite what Will said, The response in some precincts on the right is that it doesn't matter what was actually in this report. You had Senator Tommy Tuberville saying, if people don't go to jail for this, the American people should just stand up and say, listen, enough's enough. Let's don't have elections anymore. Well, obviously, they haven't read the report. So that's part of the problem is that people shoot from the hip. They don't bother to do the hard work of actually looking at the evidence, looking at what was amassed. I mean, it was the big problem with the Mueller report was that very few people read it, and certainly least of all its critics. Clearly, there is something wrong when there are 144, as my recollection is, contacts between Russian operatives and a presidential campaign. 
Never in the history of this country, I would venture to say, has anything like that ever happened. So clearly, the Trump campaign was, if not seeking to collude, they were certainly receptive to getting information from Russian sources, which may or may not have even been actual information, may simply have been disinformation. So the fact that Durham spent, what is it, four years on this report, spent millions of American taxpayer dollars putting it together, I'm sort of with Will saying that it's probably a good thing that we have this report on the other side, but only if people bother to read it and bother to adduce the right lessons from it. And clearly, the media on the right is not doing that. They're out there touting something that doesn't exist. Look, I think the idea that the FBI could be overzealous and may not be as careful as it should, why should that be a surprise? (laughs) And this is part of the problem with bureaucracies. People get entrenched. They don't always do things the right way. But we had, I thought, a very thorough Inspector General report a couple of years ago from Michael Horowitz, which I think did much of what the Durham report does and probably did it with less money involved and more lucidly than the Durham report. But this should be the end of it. And the problem is that we have Republicans in Congress who won't let it be the end. It's sort of like the Benghazi hearings. Things happen that are not always good things. Maybe they ought to be investigated. Maybe we ought to get to the root of why things went wrong. And clearly some things did go wrong in Crossfire Hurricane, but it isn't the case that we can just simply say to the right, okay, you've had your investigation, you've produced your report, And that's the end of it. And that ought to be the end. It is ironic, isn't it, that these Republicans are so keen to find misbehavior and excessive zeal on the part of the FBI, who are, after all, federal cops. But when it comes to local cops, uh, they're always (laughs) willing to overlook any zealousness against wrongdoers. Uh, Nor were they complaining, the the people on the right complaining a lot when the FBI was doing stuff with Martin Luther King and others that were not too cool. We're all juggling life, a career, and trying to build a little bit of wealth. The Brown Ambition Podcast with host Mandy and Tiffany the Budget Nista can help. How can I protect myself from identity theft? I think the first thing is to be aware of what phishing attempts look like. So check that email address. But now it's like coming to your text. You get phishing texts now? Girl, yes. Talking about this the IRS. I'm like, girl, so you texting yes. now? <laughs> with your <laughs> lack of funding? <laughs> Brown Ambition. Wherever you listen. Okay, so we're going to do something slightly different for our third topic, which is I've asked uh, all of you to list the two best things and the two worst things about the Biden presidency so far. So, Will Salatin, start with you. Oh, now I feel bad because I'm going to take somebody else's option. (laughs) It's a privilege of the uh, (laughs) guest. (laughs) Okay, okay. Well, I'll just say, so some of my favorite things about Biden, first of all, a major war happened on his watch. Russia invaded Ukraine and Joe Biden rallied the world against Russia. It was absolutely crucial that an American president stand up, that he believe in our alliances, that he build our alliances, that he not do what Donald Trump did and attack our allies. And Biden has done that. He has done as good a job of that as I think could be expected of a president. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is that Joe Biden took on climate change, which to me is a very important issue. And I'm not a fan of the title of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which was not actually inflation reduction, but in there were a lot of steps that the Congressional Research Service said will reduce climate emissions significantly. I won't bore you with all the numbers, but they put out a report and it will make a big difference in what I think is the the number one long-term problem that our planet faces. The worst things about Joe Biden, one of them is that Joe Biden is not a particularly good talker and he just doesn't do a good job of explaining to people why he's doing what he's doing. And that puts everyone who stands on the other side from Donald Trump in a difficult position because we need to be able to defend the record of this administration in order to prevent a Trump comeback. But the real thing that really bothers me about Joe Biden is it doesn't appear to me that Joe Biden has taken seriously or cared about the border. He just doesn't care about border security. Everyone can smell it. He's been slow to act. This is an issue that Democrats ceded to Republicans. It's not our issue. 
we're cross-pressured, progressives don't feel good about enforcing immigration laws. And the result is we've just had way too many people flooding across the border and it's out of control and everyone can see it. And even if you don't entirely disagree with Biden's policies, there's a humanitarian issue and there's a huge political issue that the right can now run on. Democrats are not protecting our borders. Elect us Republicans in order to get somebody who will deal with that issue. Okay. Damon. My number one thing is our Ukraine policy. I think Biden's Ukraine policy is a kind of um, perfect exemplification of statesmanship in the sense that he has stood for principle and national interest, but combined that with a statesman's necessity to meet reality where it is. So I very much like that he has rallied the world and stood by Ukraine's side, organized the sanctions against Russia, but also he stood up against those who wanted an even more aggressive military response and said, actually, no, we have to be cautious here. We're walking a tightrope. And I think he's balanced on that tightrope very well. Under the rubric of statesmanship, I will also add that I think the blocking of chip exports to China and the AUKUS nuclear sub deal in checking China's rise also deserve a lot of praise. So I think on foreign policy, with one brief exception I'll mention in a moment, I think Biden has been far better than uh, anyone had any reason to expect, really. I mean, not that he's been terrible in his career, but he's also come out and said slightly goofy things (laughs) over the decades in public life. And he's really, I think, risen to the challenge. Second highlight, normalcy. (laughs) Just the fact that there really is isn't a truly, in in the negative sense that we know from Trump, in terms of populism. There's not a populist bone in Biden's body in the sense that he does not, for the most part, pander to and weaponize what is worst in his own voters. And in that sense, he's really, I think, succeeded in what he promised to do, which is lower the temperature in Washington as much as he can and throughout the country as much as he can. Obviously, he hasn't eliminated our populist threat and problems, but uh, he's done a good job. Can I do two quick worsts? Yeah, sure thing. Okay. um, First of all, I'm sorry to say, but I think the American Rescue Plan was just really too big. $1.9 trillion of stimulus after two very large multi-trillion dollar stimulus packages passed over the previous 14 or 15 months was way too much. It was a waste, added to the deficit enormously and debt, and then also, of course, helped to contribute to our battle with inflation, which is now haunting the Biden administration. It is going down slowly and hopefully will continue to recede. But clearly, in hindsight, this was an overcompensation for the fact that the Obama administration understimulated the economy in 2009 after the financial crisis. So that was a mistake. And secondly, although I supported Afghanistan withdrawal and very much think that we're in a much stronger position, both vis-a-vis Russia and China, because we're no longer in Afghanistan. Clearly, the way the administration handled and oversaw the withdrawal was a kind of rolling disaster that was terrible for the people on the ground and really quite bad for America's image around the world. So that clearly was a face plant that one wishes had been handled far better than it was. Okay, we're running out of topics here. Just kidding. There are many. I wrote down about 15 because I figured <laughs> other people would, would hit on mine. So Linda Chavez. Well, in the good category, he's not crazy. <laughs> that may be a low bar, but we had four years of crazy. And so just having somebody who's sort of a normal, decent human being, I think that's good. And I, of course, echo what others have said in terms of his direction on foreign policy and certainly his support of Ukraine is certainly the top of my list on the good categories. In terms of the worst things he's done, I'd piggyback on the idea of the excruciatingly large amount of money that he wanted to spend in certain areas. And I would just pinpoint the debt forgiveness for student debt. He's asking the two-thirds of Americans who don't go to college basically to forgive the debt of the one-third of Americans who do. And while I think the accumulating debt of students for higher education is a looming disaster, 
I don't think that forgiveness of debts already incurred is the right way to go. I think it's just backwards. I frankly think the emphasis ought to be on spending more to allow more people to get education, not necessarily four-year degrees, maybe even vocational education, to do that and to fund more community colleges. The other bad thing that he's done is in the area of race and sex. And I'd point to two things. One is the reversal of the Title IX regulations that were handed down during the Trump years, which brought back a modicum of due process for those accused of sexual harassment or sexual assault. I thought those were one of the only positive things that I could commend the Trump administration for and for President Biden to pull those back and issue new regulations, which I don't think were good, is a bad thing. And I think he's about to do something. At least the word is that on the anniversary, May 25th, of the George Floyd death, that the Department of Justice is going to announce a new rules in terms of how they handle the assignment of law enforcement and law enforcement activities, which would ban consideration of race or ethnicity in assigning police. And I think that if that happens, as it is foretold, it will be a very bad thing. And in particular, it will be a bad thing for communities of color who live in areas where they are so much more likely than other Americans to be victims of crime. Those are my contributions. Okay. Bill Galston. Well, Mona, like you, I prepared for the worst. (laughs) 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 I would be at the end or close to it. And I have to say, I've been crossing items (laughs) off the top of my list, left and right. So let me tell you what I'm left with. So good things about the Biden administration, incorporating by reference, as the lawyers would say, all of the points that my worthy colleagues have already made. I think in a very old fashioned way, he doesn't believe that all members of the other party are evil. And I think that that has enabled him to set a better tone, some of which is being exemplified, for example, in the debt ceiling discussions. And secondly, I think he deserves a lot of credit for having established the fundamental opposition between democracy and authoritarianism as a theme of his foreign policy and of his presidential campaign long before the campaign began. And that enabled him to anticipate a lot of things that have happened since. I mean, he was better prepared intellectually for the Russian invasion of Ukraine because of the framework of thinking that he had established for himself and for the people around him in the run-up to the 2020 presidential campaign. What's not so great about him? Well, here are two points. First of all, he doesn't have much of an internal regulator. And so when he decides to do something, he often goes too far. Exhibit A for this is what I regard as one of the real low points of the Biden administration, and that is his denunciation of the Georgia election law changes as, quote, Jim Crow 2.0. If I had a lot of time, you know, I would go into detail about just how far over the top that statement was and how needlessly inflammatory it was. It was an effort to respond to the criticism that he hadn't been forceful enough in the defense of voting rights. A lot of people were saying that because they wanted him to do what he had no power to do. Uh, And so he decided on strong words as a substitute for effective action, uh, which was not available to him. And I very much regret that speech and others like it. Uh, Secondly, on a number of issues, He has placed, in my judgment, too much emphasis on party unity and too little on national unity. And I would say that the Dobbs decision gave him the opportunity to reinforce and endorse what is already a national consensus on the issue of abortion and many other issues that are tied to abortion. And instead, he has gone along with an effort to maximize the political advantage that the Democratic Party can get out of the issue. 
And I'm not saying it would have been an easy choice, you know, to articulate the voice of the nation as opposed to the voice of the party on that and other contested issues. But it is an opportunity missed in my judgment. Okay, thank you. Well, you've all uh, very expertly (laughs) ticked off many of the things that I was thinking of. I would underline the response to Ukraine three times in red. That is the great accomplishment, in my opinion, of his first term, hopefully not his last, and he deserves all honor for it. The only thing I would add is that when it comes to countering China, he has done it in mostly in ways that I think are far more important than the way that Trump attempted to do it. So Trump applied tariffs to Chinese goods, which mostly hurt American consumers and didn't much affect China. Uh, Unfortunately, Biden has kept all of those tariffs. And Biden has had a much more comprehensive approach. And so, for example, he passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which forbids goods from being sold in the United States if they have good reason to think they're produced with slave labor. He has limited, I think Damon mentioned this, but he's put export controls on certain microchip technology, which is very important. He has strengthened our alliances with Australia and Britain, giving uh, nuclear submarine technology to Canberra and so on. And those are really solid chessboard moves to check Chinese power that I think he hasn't gotten enough credit for. And I would also just mention these things. Most of the time when you do good, it doesn't get enough attention, especially in this fast moving news cycle. But he um, prevented a potentially ruinous rail strike. So that is a story that did not happen, but could well have. So that's very good. On the negative side, agree about the Afghanistan withdrawal. There are serious people who believe that the method of that withdrawal contributed to Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. And again, the other thing that I would also just echo is the student loan forgiveness is not only bad policy, but it is arguably unconstitutional. That's just not the way we do things by executive order. And it was wrong when Trump tried to do it with the wall funding, and it's wrong when Biden tried to do it. Hopefully the courts will strike it down. All right. Well, thank you one and all for those. Those were very comprehensive. And now let us turn to our highlight or low light of the week, Damon Linker. We were talking earlier uh, relating to Will's uh, very good book about Lindsey Graham, about the lack of courage that is sometimes shown by our leaders and in Congress. I want to highlight, by way of a low light, an example of that at a very different level of importance, but it's still significant and almost a little personal to me. I'm talking about the fact that uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein is still in the Senate This week, the New York Times ran a story that adds to our knowledge about what's been going on with her. She's 89, was already showing advanced signs of confusion, dementia. She then contracted shingles. And then we now know it developed into encephalitis, as well as other problems that she's still suffering from and that have left her diminished and weaker than ever using a wheelchair. The fact that she was out of the Senate for quite a long time has really slowed down efforts by the Democrats to get judges approved, which is crucially important given the razor thin margins in the two houses of Congress. But as someone whose father died within the last year of Alzheimer's, I just want to say that nobody is benefiting by people walking on eggshells around Senator Feinstein on this issue. My own father became quite ill, was living on his own, did not want to leave and move and go into assisted living, fought it tooth and nail, and my brother and I had to take a stand for his own good to insist that he do that. And we have no regrets that we did, but why is it that her colleagues, her family, her friends are not taking a stand and saying, you've had an incredible, admirable career, Senator, but the time has come to retire. You really have to hang it up now for your own sake. It's not doing anything for your legacy to have your career come to an end like this. So it pains me to see it happening, and it pains me to have to draw attention to it further, but I feel pretty strongly about it. So that's my low light of the week. 
Thanks, Damon. And just to be baldly political, I mean, it isn't as if she were to resign, she would be replaced by a Republican governor. Of course, as she comes from, you know, California, the bluest of all blue yes, states. exactly. Okay, Bill Galston. Uh, regrettably, this one is easy. Continuing my weeks-long string of lowlights, haven't been in a celebratory mood lately, I guess, I would nominate President Biden's decision to cancel his trip to Australia and Papua New Guinea. The United States is paying a real and measurable price you know, for the failure, which is a collective failure, but it involves the White House, to address and resolve the debt ceiling problem in a timely manner. Everybody knew what was going on. We've known for months, a colleague of mine at Brookings has been flagging the debt ceiling date and imminence for nearly a year now. And it was allowed to develop to such a point that a very important diplomatic meeting, important because of the need to strengthen the forces in East Asia and the Pacific that are restraining Chinese expansionism, the president was forced to cut that visit short to not to go to Papua New Guinea to sign an important new treaty of defense cooperation. And yeah, the president can go back later, but the signal that that decision sent is that political difficulties on the domestic front in the United States are having a measurable effect on the ability of the United States to conduct very, very important diplomatic meetings and to pursue what is arguably the most important strategic objective that the United States has in the world today. And I have to say, I do not understand why the White House thought it was necessary to do this. The president has very able negotiators, and if he needed to get involved, he could have gotten involved by Zoom to break log jams, to make the decisions at the end that need to be made. I cannot believe that serious people like Steve Verschetti couldn't have conveyed the essence of the difficulty very quickly and teed up the decision that the president needed to make. I just think that what they did was a big mistake, and I have to say, I do not understand why they did it. Okay. Linda Chavez. Well, I'm going to change what I was going to say because I was going to do another downer, but I've done a lot of downers and we got a big dose of down from from others already. So I'm going to do a highlight. It's a cultural highlight. This is not something that I read, but it's something that I watched on Amazon Prime. And it's a film called Living. It is a film that was sort of loosely based on a film from 1952 by the Japanese director Kurosawa. And that film was called Ikiru. And both of them were based on the short story, one of my favorites, by Leo Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Illich. It was an absolutely lovely film. If you want to spend an hour and a half, two hours watching something that will be uplifting, that will be beautiful, that has lovely music, one of the best performances by an actor I've seen in recent years, Bill Nye, it is absolutely worth watching. And it's all about a man who learns that he has a terminal illness. He is a bureaucrat who has led a pretty boring and not particularly contributing life over the years, uh, basically pushing papers in an office and being more of an impediment than someone who contributes to something better in the world. But when he finds out that he's dying and he realizes he has only a few months to live, he turns his life around. So that's my highlight of the week. I hope that's an upper. Thank you. Will Salatin. So I have a combo highlight low light, and it's playing off of what Linda said about the student loans and the whole college versus non-college America. I've been a longtime fan of sort of taking down the college industrial complex and its control over too much of our country. The highlight is that uh, this is a report that was in the Washington Post this week about a lot of governors who are moving to open jobs in state government 
to people who don't have college degrees, getting rid of the whole gatekeeping thing that you have to have a college degree. There are lots of other ways to learn and to become qualified for a job or to prove that you're capable of a job. So this has happened in my state of Maryland, uh, but governors from across the political spectrum are beginning to do this. I'm very encouraged about that. The low light is related to that, and that is a story that was in ProPublica this week about this unbelievable emerging industry of manufacturing, I have to be careful about how I say this, scholarly papers by high school students to help them get into college. Apparently, according to this report, about 12,000 students, high school students every year are paying $2,500 to $10,000 to work with these graduate students and professors who are hired to be mentors to help them sort of craft what are billed as scholarly papers and put in, I don't know how to describe this other than a fake or misleading online journals that are not really scholarly journals. And this is all, of course, designed to help get them into college. And they even have what they call publication specialists who are supposed to connect you to getting published. So it's grotesque. And it's a reminder that for all of the people out there who complain about standardized testing, that it's somehow biased against black or brown students or poor students, standardized testing is the most biased criterion for getting into college, except for absolutely everything else. And so all of these ways in which rich kids or wealthier kids can afford to manufacture some kind of appearance of merit, like these fake scholarly (laughs) papers, are a reminder of why we should find more neutral criteria and why we should have less of this college industrial complex controlling our lives. Thank you. All right. I want to mention, so a couple weeks ago, I wrote a piece about the candidacy of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. for president. So the most important thing is not that he's a whack job, which he is, but to note the incredibly cordial reception that he has received on the right. I mean, there are some Democratic primary voters, in fairness, who have also given him a bit of a boost, probably just because they are at the moment in a crabby mood about another Biden term. And so they're saying, yeah, that other guy, that Kennedy guy, without focusing on which Kennedy this is. But so just to refresh people's recollection, this is the guy who believes that vaccines cause autism and peanut allergies and other illnesses. He alleges that a bad polio vaccine killed 496,000 people in India. He is the originator of the idea that Bill Gates is using vaccines to inject people with microchips. He doesn't think that Lee Harvey Oswald killed his uncle. He doesn't believe that Sirhan Sirhan killed his father. He thinks the CIA did both. That gives you a flavor. But he has been getting praise from tablet magazine and from a number of right-wing outlets. The most recent entry here is Matthew Scully, who I used to admire, but he's written a piece in National Review, no less, the real Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And here's a couple sentences. He says, and here is my layman's diagnosis of this dangerous character. The source of Kennedy's troubles is a chronic inability to tolerate the intellectual dishonesty he finds in his antagonists. He would fully recover, returning to the life of liberal accolades he once knew if only he didn't have so much integrity. Wow. So I'll just let that speak for itself. And with that, I would like to thank our guest, Will Salatin, and thank our regular panel. Also want to note Our sound engineer today is Jonathan Seary with editing help from Aaron Keene. Our producer, as always, is Katie Cooper. We thank our audience and we will be back next week as every week. Dissecting politics with exclusive interviews, commentary and humor. Useful Idiots with Katie Halper and Aaron Mate. I really don't like sharks and I think we live in a very shark-agandistic world. Quote, one thing to keep in mind is sharks are not out there trying to eat surfers and swimmers. They'd much rather eat fish, but in many cases they mistake us for their actual prey. When they do bite, they usually move on. That's supposed to make us feel better? Useful Idiots, wherever you listen. 